Forestry worker Travis Walton was abducted by UFO on November 5th, 1975, while he was working near Snowflake, Arizona. Travis was missing for five days and six hours. After days of searching with scent dogs and helicopters, Travis says he reappeared by the side of a road near Heber, Arizona. All of this started with a strange light in the sky. Well, it wasn't especially bright. It was just a glow that was out of place in the woods. You know, normally you just wouldn't see any kind of light. Um, um, One of the first thoughts was maybe some deer hunters, you know. It was deer hunting season. We'd heard shots in the distance that day, and that was the first thought. But the light was coming from higher up than any sort of a, you know, tent or campfire would have been. So it was well above ground level. And uh, it recalled to mind for us, you know, our encountering a tree that had been hit by lightning uh, the night before and was on fire up up high. And we, you know, we got out and put the fire out, of course. But uh, um, that's where the name of the movie Fire in the Sky came from, is that, you know, we were wondering if this was uh, a similar fire that had uh, uh, started but that was just an initial impression. We were just nothing, nothing that we, um, could come up with that it might be, you know, could it be the sun going down? But you no, know, that was quite a bit earlier. Uh, could it be the moon? No, we can see that in a different direction. You know, any, any sort of a thing. It wasn't all alarming or anything that, at first that any, it was just kind of like idle curiosity at first, but the longer, it went the more it wasn't fitting in with things and the more focused the the attention of the whole crew became on what the heck could that glow be paramount movie made it look uh, like molten lava it was described by you know um uh, some of the crew as looking like molten metal but it was more the color of like a um, uh, white hot you know like molten steel being, you know, poured liquid, you know, when it's so, so hot that there's barely any yellow to it anymore. It's, it's giving off a, almost a white light, but it, it never looked like, uh, it was depicted in the movie, which looked more like a, a pool of red molten lava. And that, that's, that wasn't accurate. I said, Mike, hurry up and get up there where we can see what it is, because uh, I could see that the light was coming through a break in the trees and it was sort of washing across the road ahead. So I, um, knew that, um, you know, at that point we'd have a clear view of the source of the light. So, um, closer we got to that, the more, you know, uh, intense the crew's, uh, attention became. And when we got to that point, you know, we, I call it burst into the clearing in a way that, you know, we could suddenly see it and it was just, there was just no mistake in what we were looking at. Uh, one of the guys in the back, um, I think it was Alan Dallas yelled out, it's a flying saucer or it's a spaceship, something like that. Um, it, as if anybody needed to say what it was, it was there that was less than a hundred feet away, a, a glowing metallic disc, you know, unmistakable. And, uh, the, uh, the the skeptic uh, suggestion that what we actually saw was the planet Jupiter is just laughably <laughs> absurd. Yeah. You know, and there's just no way this was not a tiny point of light off in the distance. This was a clearly defined object. At this point, Travis gets out of the truck. I had to know why. Was it curiosity? I th- I'd say curiosity I had a whole heck of a lot to do with it. And an assumption that this thing was going to take off and be gone uh, in a very short period of time. You know, very often the crew is driving down the road and will catch sight of some animal and, you know, try to say, hey, look over there, it's a bobcat or whatever. And by the time their attention is, you know, directed in that, in that direction, it it's already gone. So it was my thinking when I got out of that truck heading towards it, that this thing would be gone before I had gone very far. Um, a couple of the other guys uh, have insisted that to them it looked like I was in some kind of a trance, you know. But, you know, turning around looking back at it, the crew, I'd, I'd say everybody looked 
entranced, you know what I mean? We were, you know, in complete awe of what we were seeing. It was astonishing, you know, and the, the look on our face, everybody's face probably would have been one of total astonishment. So at this point, Travis is looking up at this craft and the craft shoots out a light and hits him. In the movie Fire in the Sky, you see the actor being thrown across the screen. I was curious if being hit with the light was just as violent in real life as we saw in the movie. No, actually, I'd say it was more violent in that strange than the movie portrayed it. I think the the problem was they were afraid somebody might be looking down at their popcorn and missed that the point in the in the movie, and so they tried to drag it out. They made it look like the light came on and held the actor there and kind of just you know held him for a little bit before it tossed him back. But it it, it was more you know from what everybody describes it as just a blast of energy that, that just threw me through the air so violently that they immediately concluded that it had killed me. You know, he's dead. And they said that they were yelling at each other. He's, he's dead. It killed him. And, um, there, there was, there was no mistaking that, you know, John's description of my body landing like a sack of meat, you know, like there wasn't a bone in my body, you know, uh, spoke to the fact that, you know, the violence of it was so powerful, you know, to th- literally throw you through the air, uh, 15 or 20 feet is, um, uh, you know, I, I find no fault with those guys taking off at that point. They they did what anybody with any smarts would do is just get the heck away from the danger. There's no point in getting somebody else killed to save a dead man. Travis is a better man than I am. Very forgiving. All of his friends had taken off. It makes me wonder why they intentionally fired upon Travis. Well, I, I'm not so certain anymore that they had hit me with a, uh, in any sort of a deliberate firing of a weapon, although that's one possibility. I went through a whole range of possibilities of what this energy might be. And some, some people trying to explain it away, um, actually come up with some pretty <laughs> unusual concepts. You know, the Mogollon Rim being a giant fault line there, uh, it was speculated that there had been some kind of an earthquake and that this was like what they call earthquake lights, uh, where, you know, it, the stories of it's, it generates a, a kind of a, like a earth to sky sort of a, a lightning bolt, uh, generated by the, you know, torsion in, in the rocks underneath the earth, supposedly trying to explain this away, of course. Um, some of this energy came up out of the earth, came through my body and caused me to hallucinate. And this was a pretty elaborate theory that, uh, uh, Dr. Persinger uh, came up with, but, uh, it just fails miserably in, in explaining how could, uh, seven people have the same hallucination. Certainly this supposed earthquake light couldn't have passed through them too. Uh, you know, it just, it, it just didn't make any sense. But um, that's one possibility. Another possibility that it actually was actual lightning, since that part of the Mogollon Rim there has the second highest frequency of lightning strikes of any place in the continental United States. If that was um, lightning caused by this feature, uh, perhaps um, it had actually struck the craft and then as a secondary discharge passed through me on its way to ground. There's um, a number of possibilities. Um, the descriptions that were given by the lawmen inter- uh, interviewing these people and putting in their report was, you know, one described it as looking like a foot-wide blue laser beam. Another describing it as looking like a long blue flame. Uh, another described it as being like a, like a lightning bolt. And so, you know, this blast of energy, it was actually also compared to like stepping on a landmine or, um, you know, something of that nature. I asked Travis, what was his next memory? Well, you know, it's, uh, not my favorite part of the description, but I woke up on board the craft. Uh, didn't know where I was at first. Eventually, you know, came to 
remember approaching the craft and then thinking that perhaps I'd somehow been injured and taken to a hospital because I knew it was on some kind of raised surface. Yeah, I felt this device across my chest. There was a light above me. Ceiling seemed closer than it ought to be, so it seemed like uh, it was on some sort of raised surface, not laying on the floor, but in a very, you know, half there, in and out, sort of a barely conscious sort of a feeling. At the same time, um, feeling a lot of pain, you know, a feeling of suffocation, um, a feeling of impending danger or something that uh, generated a tremendous amount of fear in me. But, you know, what, what could be wrong? What, what, are the, what are the doctors up to? Thinking I'm in a hospital, thinking that these are doctors I'm, I'm hearing moving around me. But when I, my vision finally cleared and I could see these beings, you know, I just, uh, I knew where I was and it was an incredible burst of fear and adrenaline that uh, went through my body that uh, gave me enough strength to get off of the table. Uh, this device they had on top of me it fell off and I just, uh, grab for something to defend myself with, flailing at them, and, you know, making threatening, striking sorts of movements. They, at that point, had begun to approach me, but, you know, hadn't really gotten close enough to where I could, within striking distance. I was just flailing away in a way to sort of uh, try to scare them away from coming any closer, screaming the whole time, just, you know, basically out of my mind with fear, just totally hysterical. Uh, you know, to the max, to maximum fear, more, more fear than I've ever felt any time in my entire life. But it was the feeling of being mortally wounded that something was terribly wrong inside that, uh, and then feeling trapped. But above all, the feeling of suffocation. Nothing adds to panic more than the feeling of suffocation. You know, I've made the comparison to waterboarding. Some, uh, you know, uh, an interrogation technique that, you know, everybody involved knows is not going to be fatal. They, they've even trained for it, but it still works because um, it uh, generates a, a level of fear that's n n like nothing else. Uh, so this over-the-top fear uh, and this dimly lit environment very cramped quarters, a real um, claustrophobic sort of feeling. But um, my my driving thought at that moment was escape, of course. They left the room abruptly, uh, hopefully, you know, uh, as a response to my uh, combativeness. I went looking for a way out. I encountered a, another type of being that I at first took to be a human being. And in, in later, you know, thoughts, um, I think that these were probably not actual humans, but some a type of being close enough to, I think, probably um, just chosen because I took them to be human and that I, you know became less combative, of course, you know, that uh, if they if they were were trying to, in some way, give me some sort of medical treatment and help me to recover from the effects of being hit with that energy, then, then it was important that I uh, cooperate. And I, once I became combative with these small creatures and my fear of them was not going to be overcome in any timely manner, so... I, I think, you know, whether these, you know, people have offered various theories, these human-looking beings were actually some sort of a, an illusion or a, uh, some sort of mechanical or um, other sort of method just used to make me think that something that looked kind of human would um, help me out of there. But um, whatever it was, whatever these beings were. I don't think it's too far-fetched for there to be alien creatures quite similar to humans. 
I also don't think that it's too far-fetched for there to be various things that get lumped into the category of, quote, grays that are actually um, very similar species that just, um, you know. Travis describes these little creatures as gray aliens. And I was curious, if he could have gotten his hands on one, would he have killed it? I, I think, you know, they were probably, even in my weakened condition like that, you know, my advantage of being so much larger than them was was so clear cut, and you know, probably would have done a lot of serious harm. And on top of that, um, I, I think that they probably were trying to gain some sort of telepathic control. At this point in the interview, I noticed Travis getting very uncomfortable talking about the telepathy and how they were unable to. And and looking back now, I wish I would have asked more questions, but he's actually talked about this before in the past. He talked a lot about the feeling of being suffocated. And I was curious if he felt like that was from his injuries or if that was from the craft he was on. Well, uh, I don't know. It could be either one, you know, it could have been on account of the injuries, but um, I'm, Today, in discussions with artists about recreating these scenes, it became more obvious to me that it was probably more likely to do with some sort of a quality in the atmosphere inside that craft, because I did notice a fairly clear-cut difference once I exited the craft. In most abductions, you only hear of people running into the gray aliens, for example, in Travis's encounter, he not only ran into the Greys, he also ran into this other entity that looked more human-like. I asked Travis, do you think you actually ran into two separate entities, or do you think they were presenting themselves as human to get him to calm down? The first alternative you offered there is, is probably just the most uh, simplest, you know, that, that the there being, I think, uh, quite a wide variety of uh types of beings uh, visiting this planet and, uh, you know, probably uh, quite a bit of uh, intercommunication amongst them as distinct from having uh, very limited communication with Earth people. And so it, the easiest thing would just be find somebody that um, can gain his trust and, and get, him, get him back under anesthesia and uh, get these uh, medical problems dealt with. Nowadays, they're calling them Nordics, uh, but, uh, you know, I don't think they had that term back then. Uh, as well, the, uh, the term greys, uh, I don't think they had that term. I'd never heard such a thing. Um, and, you know, I never even described them as being, quote, gray. It was semi grayish white, maybe. You know, they were very pale uh, in their uh, you know, coloring. When I think of gray aliens, I think of this. I asked Travis, were the eyes just black? I mean, was there any sort of intelligence there? Oh, there was definitely an intelligence. It wasn't just black, you know. And I, I know many people describe them as having just a, just a solid black eye. But uh, these, these beings definitely had an iris, a pupil, eyelids that blinked. And um, it's my theory that they're being there in their own environment, that, that they at that point didn't need the kind of black eye covering that probably explains uh, the appearance of other ones that are called grays that, you know, see anything with really large eyes is probably something that exists for most of the time in a very low light environment, you know, something that lives deep under the sea or a cave dwelling animal or something that's strictly nocturnal is more likely to have a very large eye. So these large eyes on these this type of beings, the so-called greys, suggest to me, and even their pallor, uh, the, the paleness suggests low levels of light. And so in their own you know, comfortable environment, would not have this sort of sunglasses kind of a filter even necessary. So... That could be one explanation. After fighting with the Greys, Travis runs out of the room. He runs into a more human-looking alien. He thought at the time it was a human. 
Travis runs up to him and he's like, let's get out of here. And he's chatting with this guy. And, but the, the, this entity never actually speaks with Travis, never actually talks to him. Um, and I was curious when he walked up, did his expression ever change? Yeah, his expression did change. It seemed to be, you know, sort of a sympathetic but sort of a tolerant attitude because, you know, here I'm acting hysterical. I'm basically a raving maniac. So he's not um, um, communicating, but, you know, I thought mostly likely because of this helmet that he was wearing, thinking, well, maybe he can't talk with that on or hear clearly with it on. So, uh, you know, I... I wasn't too alarmed by the lack of uh, response to my questioning, um, even 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 though I was out of my mind and hysterical and yelling, and you know, um, I kind of on one level understood that I wasn't exactly <laughs> something to have uh, a calm conversation with. So um, I went with him. Um, you know, it was clear to me that, you know, he was going to lead me out of there. And that was exactly what I wanted. Get me out of here. The amazing part is, is where Travis ran into this human looking entity, it was actually on another craft. The original craft he was in was parked in a bigger craft. I asked Travis, this human looking entity, could he, pat if you put a suit coat on him, took the helmet off, and let him walk down the street. Could he pass for a human? Yeah, he certainly could. Yeah, he would pass for human. Once I saw more of his kind together, it was kind of odd to me that they had a sort of a resemblance. You know, even though this guy might have, you know, stood out a little bit from people. When you see a bunch of them together and they're all similar and like family sort of resemblance that that's kind of odd you know you don't normally see that you know when we encounter a group of uh, adults uh, they can vary pretty dramatically in their appearance so this human looking entity walks travis back i wonder did he ever see the grays again no i didn't ever see the grays again i think uh the not not to say that i know for sure they weren't continuing to be involved uh, but um whether these uh, human looking individuals completely took over what i think was probably some sort of a medical process something involved in so uh, in trying to correct the damage done from that blast of energy or whether you know they turned me back to the custody of these small creatures uh, Maybe their technology was better at uh, dealing with the problem, but um, I, do, I do believe that, you know, that feeling of being wounded, you know, was the main um, factor there, that, that the difference between how I felt once I was rendered unconscious there to when I uh, came to again. The beings that he left me with uh, did not, wear helmets like him. So at that point, there was no more reason to think that they would have any justifiable reason not to respond to my questions. So I was, you know, extremely anxious, even though I was in the custody of what I believed to be rescuing humans. Um, still, um, if, you know, it's reasonable to expect you're going to tell me what what are you doing with me? What, what's becoming of me? Am I going? You know, am I going to be okay? What's going on? And to get nothing in response, sort of started renewing my my panic and and fear about what was in store for me. Well, they tried to get me to lay on this table, and you know, I just come off of a table where I felt extremely trapped and. I, I was not going to cooperate until they would tell me something, you know. So I started saying, you know, you know, you know, I'm not, I'm not doing this. You got to tell me what, what are you doing? What, what, what are you doing with me? And they wouldn't answer. And they were trying to force me on the table then. And so then I started really resisting. And, uh, I was in a pretty weakened state. And, uh, I think they were probably, pretty pretty strong beings they felt very strong and didn't really have that much trouble getting me down on that table putting this mask over my face 
which caused me to lose unconsciousness. So, uh, you know, it, it's nothing special, just a mask, um, like, a, like an oxygen mask. Uh, no hoses that I could see connected to it, but something in it uh, caused me to lose consciousness. Travis told me his next memory was waking up on the road. Yeah, yeah, I woke up on the road. But, you know, how soon after? You know, I had no way of knowing how much time had passed. Was this mere minutes after? Probably yeah. not, because, uh, you know, that pain and uh, feeling of being wounded was gone. But, you know, was it a matter of hours, days? At that point, I, I had no clue how long I'd been gone. I made my way to phone booth and and my family came to get me. Um, they could tell that I was under the impression this was still the same night as uh, when the uh, incident began. But that's when I learned that no, five days had gone by. Five days and six hours. The phone booth Travis used to call his family still stands today. <laughs> 